I'm going to talk about um, the infant immune landscape and using it as a window of opportunity for um, protective vaccine or immune responses. So there's a lot going on in infant development from the time really that um, the baby is still in utero, um, but after birth there's a significant number of immune changes that are going on. Um, one, um, there's a few um, remnants from the, the fetal time period like um, transmitted maternal IgG, high T reg regulatory cells, a TH2 type bias that is um, declining during the uh, first year of life. But then there are a lot of um, adaptive immune responses that are developing as well, inclu including early B cell development, a TH1 focus, the IgM, IgG, and IgA responses develop over time, and of course the um, T cell dependent antibody uh, responses as well. So, and all during this time, we are asking a lot of the infant immune system. So this is an example of the infant vaccine schedule. Um, and you can see the number of um, vaccines that we have in clinical practice right now. And the number that are given in the first two years of life is, takes up the majority of this chart. Um, and despite all of those changes going on and that um, immune development that is taking place over the first year of life, the majority of these vaccines are highly successful. And in addition to what's going on in the first year of life is the development of a diverse uh, microbiome. And um, the, we, we've seen that in a number of studies and there are a lot of influences um, that come from the feeding practices of the infant that can contribute to the uh, diversity as well as the maternal uh, microbiome that also contributes to the development of the diversity in the microbiome of the infant. But, but in all cases, this is increasing over time in the first year of life and the inter-individual in variability also decreases over the first year of life. And so uh, this is a time window in which there's um, opportunity for um, a lot of change in both the immune responses and the microbiome. And this is an example of some of the immune development that's very relevant to vaccine development um, that's being worked out in infant immunity right now. This work comes from um, a group that, um, that focuses on infant immune system development. Uh, Lee Yin at University of Florida, John Sleesman at Duke, Maureen Goodnell, who's now at the NIH, and Christina DeParis at UNC. But they've done some really elegant work se sequencing the B cell receptor and looking at um, the development of somatic hypermutation over time in infants. And interestingly, there is um, a pretty low somatic hypermutation at, initially at birth here in the IgG uh, compartment is, is um, the most um, the least variable. Um, and there's a pretty rapid increase over the first six months of life. And then there's a, a less than um, steep increase over the next six months of life. They're still a long way off from the somatic hypermutation of an, of an adult immune system. But you can see that there's this rapid change. In addition, when we look at the, uh, the CDR3 links or the part of the antibody that's important for the antigen contact, um, you, there's also very uh, wide variability in the first year of life. At birth, shown in green, there's very long CDR3 links that then shorten over time and again expand out over the first year of life. So these are some of the important immune changes that are happening that are going to impact the uh, vaccine-elicited antibodies. So uh, my group has been interested in studying pediatric HIV immunization, and in particular, the use of the infant immune landscape to develop broad responses that can persist into adulthood or adolescence. Um, we haven't had a lot of success in making adults immune within six or 12 months, and so an opportunity really is the infant immune system in which we would have more than 10 years of time to develop broad immune responses that could be protective against all variants of HIV that an adolescent might come into contact with. And um, we, we also think of the pediatric, um, the pediatric HIV epidemic just in the first couple years of life when the infant is being exposed in utero, during delivery, and during breastfeeding um, that happen up to about age two. But there's actually a second pediatric epidemic, and that's what's happening in uh, early adolescence, and particularly in women. There's very high uptake of very high risk of HIV acquisition in young women, particularly in Southern Africa. And this risk does not begin at age 18. This risk begins at age 14, at which time that population has already doubled in the number of HIV infections from their male counterparts. And so it's really important for us to use uh, the pediatric immune system to develop immunity to HIV. And one of the most unique things about this is the window of time that you have to develop these broad responses. So over 10 years of time, in addition to different rules at play with the, with the immune system, and all this could be harnessed for better broad immune responses that may actually provide uh, broad protection. 
and it's, it's been modeled that this type of approach of immunizing uh, in pediatric settings before adolescence would actually have an impact not only on adolescent and adult HIV acquisition, but again, the next generation of pediatric HIV acquisition as well. So it's really an ideal um, target population. The other uh, factor that makes this an ideal target population is um, that infants um, already come to the doctor many times during the first few years of life to get their vaccines. And in fact, the only time in which we've had a very successful multi-dose uh, vaccine strategy be implemented with high coverage is in the infant immune system or in, in the infant vaccine schedule. So um, for an example, in the infant hepatitis B vaccine um, that's now part of our regular schedule, it was initially implemented as an adolescent vaccine and the coverage was terrible. It was less than 40%. Uh, when it was found that infants could also make a very robust immune response to hepatitis B, and they were being exposed and were at risk as well of acquiring the virus from their mother, uh, it was moved into the infant uh, vaccine schedule, at which time the coverage really shot up to over 80%, and that's with a three-dose strategy. But in contrast, here's where we are with the adolescent HPV vaccine. This is US data. Um, we are still at less than 40% uptake of three doses of an HPV vaccine in adolescence. So we're not good at covering infants and adults with multi-dose vaccine strategies. And so uh, knowing what we know about the HIV vaccine strategy is that will likely be a multi-dose strategy. And so thinking about where we're going to get the, uh, the highest coverage is also important to what, uh, what rolls out as the eventual vaccine. So my group has uh, previously been looking at old infant HIV vaccine studies that were done really prior to the availability of, of or widespread availability of ART. And um, we compared this to responses that were generated by the partially protective vaccine uh, regimen in the RV144 vaccine trial. And remarkably, we found that the immune response that was associated with the reduced risk of acquisition in the RV144 trial, the IgG response of the, against the variable loop one and two, um, was actually highly um, induced in HIV vaccine studies from, um, from uh, 20 years ago that were performed with recombinant GP120, and um, it, in the best response was with an MF59 adjuvant. So infants start out with a high um, HIV envelope-specific response from their mother, because these were all HIV-exposed infants, um, and then um, this declines over time. This is the alum uh, GP120 immunized group that had um, no antibody detected by, um, by 18 months of age. But interestingly, with the MF59 uh, adjuvant, we found that the uh, responses were still highly detectable in the infants at two years of life. And when we com directly compared these to the responses that were elicited in the RV144 trial, the infants had a much higher magnitude of that V1, V2 IgG response elicited from the, the MF59 adjuvant, adjuvant vaccine, where the infant response was 20-fold higher than that of peak at peak immunogenicity from the uh, RV144 trial, and still remained at least five-fold higher um, at uh, six months after peak immunogenicity as well. And then we've gone on to isolate the uh, vaccine elicited uh, envelope-specific monoclonal antibodies from these vaccinated patients as well. And we were able to generate um, a number of GP120-specific antibodies from, uh, from at least one patient thus far that had uh, specificity to variable loops 3, the CD4 binding site, as well as conformational epitopes. And then we've looked at the characteristics of those antibodies as well. And not surprisingly, knowing um, what uh, has been generated in healthy, uh, healthy adolescents in the B cell compartment, these vaccine-elicited antibodies had a high CDR3 length compared to adult uh, GP120-elicited monoclonal antibodies. And, and compared to uh, adults in the somatic hypermutation, they had a lower somatic hypermutation rate compared to adults, as expected from, from the previous data showed in healthy infants. Um, and, and this is important because we know that broad neutralizing antibodies have um, those characteristics of very long CDR3 lengths and very high somatic hypermutation rate. Um, but what is interesting that's coming out of recent data is that HIV-infected infants may be very good at making these broad neutralizing antibodies. So um, there have been a couple papers come out from both the Julie Overbaugh group and the group um, in South Africa, Philip Golder and Lynn Morris, that HIV-infected infants may make broad neutralizing responses more frequently than that of infected adults. 
And um, Julie Overbaugh's group recently um, published that the neutralizing antibodies, these broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that they've been able to isolate in, from the infants, actually have very low somatic hypermutation rate. So potentially, the infant immune system is better set up to make these broad neutralizing antibodies without having to go, go through all the uh, limbo that an adult monoclonal antibody does to be able to um, get out of, uh, escape all of the B cell selection and exist as an antibody in the periphery. So in, in harnessing that you know, potential difference in the infant immune landscape, we've designed a clinical trial um, that we're going to be per, uh, hopefully pursuing in um, concert with the Duke Chavi ID group, the IMPACT um, clinical trials group, as well as HVTN and um, IDRI, which uh, makes an uh, adjuvant that we're going to use in this study. Um, and this is a vaccine approach that has been uh, developed to be a B-cell lineage vaccine approach in which the envelopes that are going to be used, the GP120 immunogens that are going to be used, were isolated from an adult that developed broad neutralizing activity over time. And each of the um, envelope products that are going to be used in sequence or um, in combination are from important time points in which that adult went on to um, develop an antibody that, that became a broad neutralizing antibody. And the way that these um, envelopes were selected is based on their ability to bind to the unmutated ancestor of the broad neutralizing lineage. So here uh, we were targeting the lineage of the CH103 antibody, which is a CD4 binding site antibody. So in a, in a study like this, we are going to use the gift of time that the infant immune system provides. Um, and we're going to study both the sequential and um, combination immunization with these four envelope products starting at birth with the transmitted founder envelope from that individual that developed broad neutralizing activity, um, another boost at two weeks with either an additive, um, a, a, an additional um, envelope product that came from week 53 from this broad neutralizing individual or a sequential immunization with a different envelope, and then go on to um, utilize, again, the, the schedule that the infants are already falling into with their vaccine uh, visits, two months, four months, nine months, and then continue um, repeated immunization at 18 months and annually up to age four. And so uh, and then we'll be looking for the, uh, the development of B cell lineages that may suggest that broad neutralizing activity can be elicited. But we've also had the opportunity to directly compare um, infant and adult immune responses to the same vaccine, again, going to old vaccine studies. Um, in the infants, we were able to use the, um, the a cohort that I presented earlier, which, which was from the PACTG trial 230, that used both a recombinant GP120 from uh, Chiron and a recombinant GP120 from Vaxgen. One was MF59 uh, adjuvanted and one was alum adjuvanted. The, the infants got four vaccine doses between birth and 20 weeks. And then there was a, a, a corollary adult study in which they've got either the Vaxgen or the Chiron uh, envelope with the same adjuvants. And th those were four doses given in between zero and 52 weeks. We had about the same number of plasma samples available from both of those cohorts, and so able to really narrow in on what are the differences in the infant immune response to the same vaccine product compared to adults. And what we found is that while the Vaxgen um, uh, vaccine product, which was adjuvanted with an alum, seemed to um, elicit very similar magnitude responses at the peak immunogenicity, the MF59 adjuvanted responses were very different in the adult and the infant, so that there were higher magnitude responses elicited in the infant um, against GP120, as well as the V1, V2 IgG region. And this is at peak immunogenicity, which is a time point that maternal antibody is still present. And so we then looked at one year after the vaccine, which is six months after the last infant vaccine, but only um, uh, w the same month after the uh, last adult vaccine. And uh, the same thing was true, where the infant immune response remained higher magnitude than that of the adult response, both with the GP120 response as well as the V1V2 IgG response. When we looked again at another immune correlate that came out of the RV144 vaccine trial, the V1V2 um, IgG response that uh, was a, a V3 subclass, or sorry, IgG3 subclass, seemed to be better associated with protection in the RV144 trial. So we looked at, in the infants, how frequently was a V1V2 IgG3 response elicited. And in fact, it was more frequently elicited in the infants immunized with the MF59 adjuvanted GP120, um, up to 40% compared to adults, which was only around um, 15%. 
So in summary, um, in comparing the adult and infant immune responses to the same vaccine product, infants seem to have a higher magnitude GP120 and V1V2 IgG response compared to adults, either at, both at peak immunogenicity and six months later. And the infants um, have a higher frequency of the V1V2 IgG3 response than adults. And also, uh, these responses are durable for over two years. And then um, in uh, another area of my lab, we've been looking at infant um, non-human primate models to really model what is the best regimen for induction of optimal infant vaccine responses. And so I'll show you some data from this. In this um, study, we were studying the, um, the regimens of an MVA, a pox virus vector, with a recombinant GP120. Again, this is the type of, of vaccine that went into the RV144 trial and was protective in adults. Um, so we, we had four different arms. One has got an envelope protein only. Um, the next got a um, MVA prime, and then followed by protein boosts with the red diamonds. And a, set, a third arm got the MVA and the protein at the same time. And then we had a fourth group that was an extended interval of those, uh, the combined MVA plus recombinant GP120 given at the same time. So instead of zero, three, and six weeks, which were the first three groups, the extended interval was given at zero, six, and 12 weeks. All of these uh, infants did get a um, MVA expressing gag and Paul to elicit T cell responses. But we compared the, the groups that had the same immunization schedule directly, and then we compared the group that, that got both the MVA and protein on the same um, immunization series um, to the extended interval that extended those same um, immunization regimen out to longer time between immunizations. And here's some of the results from, from those optimizations. So first we noticed that there was an early response um, to the vaccine as long as the envelope protein was included in the first vaccine. And this is something that's important to infant immunity because they're being exposed right away after birth via breastfeeding. But we also noticed that we could achieve persistent responses, again, mirroring the, the infant data as well, the human infant data. Um, so here in the extended interval group, we, uh, those animals were maintained out till after 30 weeks of age and even boosted um, once where we, we saw a memory response with the, vet, with the GP120 specific IgG. We then compared the magnitude of these different um, regimens between each other with, for those key immune responses that we think might be protective against HIV acquisition. And interestingly, the protein-only group did the best in eliciting the V1V2 IgG response. So clearly, infants are responding well to protein only. It, in addition, the neutralizing antibody um, magnitude and kinetics were actually better in the protein-only group, again, where the tier one, so the easy to neutralize viruses, were uh, neutralized at a higher magnitude by the protein-only group, and that uh, response persisted as well compared to the, those that included an MVA. And, but then when we compared the extended interval um, to see if we got any benefit from extending the interval, it did seem in comparing to just uh, the same vaccine regimen given at zero, three, and six weeks, extending the intervals out to six weeks of time between each immunization did increase the magnitude and the kinetics. And, but uh, going on to, to additional functions, we looked at the induction of ADCC titer, which seemed very similar between all of these um, different regimens. However, when we looked at a, um, a heterologous GP120, there were non-responders in each of the um, non-extended vaccine groups, and the extended intervals seemed to uh, be able to respond better to the heterologous uh, envelopes with ADCC responses. We also looked at TFH induction because um, an antibody response also uh, needs strong T cell help as well. And it seemed that the, actually the protein uh, vaccine alone was also outperforming the other, uh, the other regimens in the induction of functional uh, TFH cells in the lymph nodes and the spleen. But finally, the most interesting finding really came from when we looked at the gut. So um, we looked at the, we quantitated the number of antigen-specific B cells that were elicited by the vaccine, so um, B cells that are binding to the HIV envelope after vaccination. And it seemed very similar in the lymph node between the different groups. Um, however, what really stood out is in the extended interval group, there was, um, we actually had detectable um, envelope-specific B cells in the rectal biopsies compared to the non-extended groups did not. And so either there's an impact of age or extending those intervals on the induction of that response. And that was really mirrored when we measured the stool IgA responses between these groups as well, that the extended interval group clearly had an advantage there. So what is that telling us about how we can um, then combine this with the development of the microbiome? So um, in particular, for developing those mucosal responses. 
So one um, uh, work that has been reported that's important to the HIV vaccine field is a potential for a diverting antibody response. So this was reported by Wilton Williams and Bart Haynes et al. last year that the um, human vaccine trials that have included a uh, GP41 component to the HIV envelope have often shown that there's a high magnitude GP41 response in plasma that's elicited. And, and um, this group went on to show that on a monoclonal antibody level as well and go on to show the potential mechanism of that was cross-reactive antibodies from uh, gut microbiota reactive B cell lineages. And so therefore, what may be happening is that you um, have a uh, B cell lineages, B cell clones that are stimulated by the antigens pre presented in the gut microbiome, and those are then uh, diverted towards response to the HIV uh, GP41 component of the envelope protein that's being given for the vaccine, whereas what you really want is the, uh, the antibody responses against the potential protective epitopes that are mostly included in GP120. So, so keeping that in mind, we have this um, unique opportunity in infant vaccination where you have a uh, wide change of the microbiome composition over the time in which you would be vaccinating. So here's an example of those same infant rhesus monkeys that I was showing you the immune, immune responses on in which we've sequenced the stool microbiome over time. And again, as expected, it, it changes rapidly and adds um, taxa um, considerably over, over the first year of life. Um, we've gone on to then try to look at, you know, what are the patterns of which bacteria are grouping together in their ability to, to colonize the, at least these stool samples. And there does seem to be uh, groupings of uh, bacterial species that are, um, that are going, moving together in the kinetics at which they populate the infant gut. And this may then allow us to, to focus in on certain groups of, um, of taxa that may be important in driving the vaccine responses. And then we've, we've just started getting into trying to um, correlate the, the um, abundance of certain bacterial species to the uh, desired vaccine elicited antibody responses. And so with the uh, bacterial species being listed in this heat map um, first and the immune responses in the um, second half, we looked at uh, where there were strong correlations shown in blue with the bacterial species abundance and the uh, and the desired immune responses here, just looking at antibody responses. And there are some you know, potential suggestions that there may be certain species that are strongly correlated to high magnitude antibody responses. And um, interestingly, when, when there did seem to be a hit, like here with um, Diolister and Megasphera, which are both um, fernicutes, they, um, they seem to really um, correlate to all of the um, vaccine-elicited antibody responses that we were measuring, instead of just um, being one epitope specific or not. So, um, so this is a, just a suggestion that, that maybe this is a, a bacterial species that we could follow and look at whether there are cross-reactive epitopes between this and the uh, immune responses that we're trying to elicit with the vaccine. So in summary, I think uh, infant immunization and microbiome manipulation may be a strategy to help avoid the diverting B cell lineages and promote the protective B cell lineages with infant vaccination. We, we see that infants do have robust and durable antibody responses to a recombinant GP120 MF59 immunization. Extending the intervals may be able to elicit better mucosal antibody responses, in particular in the GI tract. And the abundance of cert certain bacteria in the infant GI tract may be associated with the magnitude of those B cell responses, and therefore we could look at whether those could be harnessed as directing uh, the infant uh, population of the microbiome to best harness the types of immune responses we're trying to achieve. So there's a ton of people to thank um, in our um, collaboration with UNC and UC Davis for our um, infant non-human primate group. Um, I want to um, recognize Kuhn von Rompe and uh, Christina de Paris, who are my major collaborators in that. And then with the infant vaccine trials that um, we work closely with the impact group um, that did all of the studies, and Jenny Fuda, in, um, who's a, a junior investigator in my lab, has, has led most of those studies. So thank you very much.